to worship at Hosanna Lutheran Church. A few announcements before we begin our worship service. The season of Lent begins this Wednesday, February 17th. As we observe Ash Wednesday, Hosanna will be offering a drive-through imposition of ashes at two different times. People are welcome to drive up for the imposition of ashes anytime between noon and 1 p.m. or between 5.30 and 6.30 p.m. And we'll show you, if you please enter on the side that has our mailbox, enter that driveway and drive on up and you get to stay in your car and Pastor Krista and the worship team will meet you at your car and we'll have uh, the ashes and we'll be applying those ashes with Q-tips. During this time, as you drive up, you will also have the opportunity to receive some resources for the season of Lent. Available on Ash Wednesday also will be a pre-recorded worship video, which will be made available on Hosanna's YouTube channel. And then finally, in the evening, from 6.45 until 7.15, there will be an intergenerational activity held via Zoom. And this is open for everyone of all ages. Are you looking to maybe explore a new prayer practice during Lent? Pastor Krista will be offering a class called Praying in Color that allows us to pray with or without words, but not it's not a spoken prayer. It's a practice that's beneficial for children to adults. The class will be offered on Tuesday evenings starting February 23rd from 5, uh, 6.30 to 7.30 via Zoom and nine people are able to meet at Hosanna during that time. A second session will be held on Wednesday morning starting February 24th from 10 to 11. This session will have up to nine people meeting at Hosanna Lutheran Church. Please RSVP your spot to Pastor Krista by either emailing her or uh, leaving a message on the phone at the church. On Sunday, February 21st, we will have a drive up communion liturgy service starting at 10 a.m. Please check your newsletter for additional information regarding that opportunity. And finally, we'd like to thank those participating in worship today. Pastor Krista Strum, members of the Desnoy family, Terry Ashworth, Lisa King, Mark Ingebretson, Nancy Wales, and thank you, Mark Ingebretson, for editing our video. Stay warm, everybody. Welcome to worship. Dear friend, I know you're going through a very challenging time right now. Please know that I am wishing you all the best in your fight with breast cancer. I love inspiring quotes, and I revisit this one by Louise Hay whenever life throws me a new stage in life. I choose to make the rest of my life the best of my life. I hope this inspires you like it does me. There's something to be said for the power of positive thinking. It is a great place to start in your journey of healing. Wishing you all the best. Rachel G. Orinoco, Minnesota. Hello, friends and family in Hosanna Lutheran. I am here to talk about Girls Love Mail, which is our God's Work Our Hands All Year Long uh, task for the month of February. We're collecting letters just like the one I wrote and just read to you uh, here at church in this uh, little enclosure by the Memorial Garden. We've got a tote, it's labeled got Girls Love Mail. And what these letters do is they are given to women who have just been diagnosed with breast cancer. So um, the organization distributes these letters to medical facilities around the country and they are there as beacons of hope for these women who have just been by diagnosed with cancer. So um, I just bought a whole packet of little cards. You can also just write your letters on regular stationery or paper. Um, they have printables that you can download off of their website if you just look for Girls Love Mail. There's lots of options for you. 
It doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be long. It just needs to be full of hope. Uh, they do ask that you don't include any religious overtones or anything that says I'm praying for you or anything like that. Just because these are given to women of all creeds, races, religions, and the like. So I hope you join me in writing a couple of letters this month for Girls Love Mail. Um, again, I'll be collecting these at church um, all the way through the end of February. So bring them on by. I'm about to go take a look at the tote right now and see how many we have. So thank you and God bless. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship with a time of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured upon on all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and you know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sin and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away, and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice, and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also be with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of our truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. First reading is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Today's reading centers on the transfer of power and authority from the prophet Elijah to Elisha. Their travels, which retrace the path of Joshua back to Moab, the place where Moses died, and the parting of the waters, demonstrate that Elisha and Elijah are legitimate successors of the great prophet Moses. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Sunday school children know this song. We sing it for Transfiguration Sunday, which is today. Come to the mountain. And in the song, we talk about how we are changed by the light of God, we're changed by the love of God, and we're changed by the power of God. So, come to the mountain. Come to the mountain, come to the mountain, come to the mountain and be transformed. Come to the mountain, come to the mountain, Come to the mountain and be transformed. Changed by the light of God, changed by the love of God, changed by the power of God on the mountain top. Come to the mountain, come to the mountain, come to the mountain and be transformed. Come to the mountain, Come to the mountain, come to the mountain and be transformed. Changed by the light of God, changed by the love of God, changed by the power of God on the mountain top. 
top. The psalm for today is Psalm 50, verses 1 through 6. The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken, calling the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God shines forth in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence, with a consuming flame before and round about a raging storm. God calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of the people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. The heavens declare the righteousness of God's cause, for it is God who is judge. The second reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. The spotlight of Christian ministry is not on the people who carry out ministry, but on the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as God made light shine at creation, God makes the light of Jesus Christ shine in our lives through Christian ministry. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's gospel comes from the Holy Gospel of Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And then he was transfigured before him. His clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them with Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwelling places, one for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. Peter didn't know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son. The beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, Peter, James, and John looked around, and they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. There they stand, Peter, James, and John, in the dazzling view, not of God's creation, but in the dazzling presence of God's Son. God's Son in the full, fullness and brilliance of the glory of God. And they were not alone. Moses and Elijah stood there with them. Have you ever stood on a mountaintop or at a lake or somewhere that was so breathtaking that the image is forever held in your brain and in your heart? Peter, James, and John climbed the mountain with Jesus, anticipating that 
view. But what they experienced in today's gospel text was oh so much more. So here they stand, stark contrast to what happened six days prior. I want to go back in time a little bit to help us understand what happened six days ago. Because it makes a difference here on the mountaintop for Peter, James, and John. And I believe it makes a difference for us today as well. Six days earlier, Jesus and disciples went to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on that way, Jesus asked the disciples a question. Who do you say that I am? The disciples answered, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say, you're one of the prophets. But Jesus pushed a little harder, saying, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered him not to tell anyone about this. Now, after this conversation, Jesus began to teach the disciples that he must undergo great suffering. He will be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, the scribes, and those in authority. He will be killed and in three days will rise again. Jesus had this discussion with his disciples and talked quite openly and freely with them about this. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus turned, looked at the disciples, and rebuked Peter then, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on not divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus called the crowds together with his disciples, and once again he began to teach, saying, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So here we stand on the mountaintop with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. They've spent six days trying to process what in the world they just heard. The one that they've identified and proclaimed as the Messiah has just told them He's going to be rejected and killed by the religious leaders and those in authority. I wonder if they even heard or could comprehend the words beyond, I will be killed. I wonder if they even heard, and in three days will rise again. So six days have passed, and they walk with Jesus up to the mountaintop. I wonder what they were longing to hear, see, and experience that day. They get to the mountaintop and they encounter Jesus briefly in the fullness of the glory of his divinity. They hear words from heaven, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him. In Jesus' transfiguration, Jesus is not changed. Jesus is still fully human and fully divine. But there was a change in his appearance, how he appeared to Peter, James, and John, and what that experience revealed to them. Jesus' transfiguration, the glowing brilliance of white, whiter than can be bleached, the glow of divinity, gives them a new vision, a new way of understanding who this Jesus is. Jesus' transfiguration transforms the disciples in the story and transforms our lives by removing the things that cloud our vision. Can you imagine 
hearing the words Jesus spoke six days earlier and now experiencing the divinity of this man. The transfiguration stands between the time in the church, the time in our lectionary between Pentecost, where the church is called and learning what it means to be church, and the season of Lent. The time when we, the church, prepares to be thrust back into the truth. The truth of our utter dependence on God. The truth that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. On Wednesday, on Ash Wednesday, we enter into the Lenten journey with Jesus to the cross. We are confronted and called to acknowledge our mortality, our brokenness, and our dependence on God. Like the disciples enter into this time, we enter into the Lenten time together. But this message of Jesus and his divinity also is with us and for us in the times of our lives that may not coincide with the Lenten liturgical year. But in the times of our lives, when we are called by the events of our lives to face our mortality, our brokenness. The events of the transfiguration give us something to hold on to. We have had a glimpse of Jesus, the fullness of his glory and his power, and being called to listen to him, even in the midst of what is to come. Now, Jesus, in his time with Peter, James, and John on the mountaintop, ends their time together with instructions not to say a word until he's risen from the dead. Jesus' death is imminent, and he's embraced his identity as one who will die and be raised. Jesus is signaling the journey ahead that will be coming when he and his disciples leave the mountain. It is the one thing to have had the mountaintop experience with Jesus, up in the clouds where everything is brilliant. But that's not the be-all and end-all of who Jesus is and of Jesus' ministry. This mountaintop experience is a promise that holds us in see deep and secure into who Jesus is. He's gathered there with Peter, James, and John. Elijah and Moses are there to, to signify and to call for the church for the disciples, for you and I to realize our crucial work in the world. The crucial work that we have in the world accompanying Jesus to the cross, the taking up of our crosses, the listening to God's Son and following God's Son's lead to the cross. Knowing we are not called to have power over others, but to rise up as dust, dust that has been formed by the breath of God to give life to others. May we enter into the seizing of Lent with a holding on to the vision of the glory of Jesus at the mountaintop. May this vision carry us through the realities of our mortality and bring us hope, strength, and courage as we live each day. May our lives live out Christ's mission in the world. May Christ's light shine within our lives each and every day.
joy that the following people have been elected to positions of leadership and we are grateful for your saying yes to God's call. In holy baptism our Lord Jesus Christ liberated you from sin and death and made you members of his church. Through the word and sacrament you have been nurtured in faith. I ask you together with all who are gathered to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we are baptized. I'll invite you all to mute yourself and join with me as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. St. Paul writes, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives everyone ability for their particular service. The spirit is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. You have been elected to the position of leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith reflect Jesus Christ in whose name we gather. You are to work together with other members to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation and God's will is done in this community and in the whole world. You are to be diligent in your specific area of serving that the one Lord who empowers you is glorified. You are to be examples of faith active in love to help maintain life and harmony in this congregation. So those being installed, I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself now. And I have this question to ask you. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, are you ready to accept faithfully and carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, please answer, yes, by the help of God. Yes, yes by, the by the help, help of God. God. And now I'll ask you to mute yourself and the those of you representing the congregation tonight, I invite you to unmute yourselves. People of God, I ask you, will you pray Will you support these, your elected leaders? Will you pray for them and encourage them? Will you share in mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? If so, please answer, yes, yes. by the help of God. Yes, by the help, yes. by the help of God. I now declare to you, installed leaders of this congregation, God bless you with his Holy Spirit, that you may prove faithful servants of Christ. Amen, and thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to give somebody a text or call somebody later today and share God's peace with them and encourage them as well. 
Our worship continues with an opportunity to give our thanks to God through our gifts and our offerings. We invite you to use this time to prepare your offerings or send them in electronically. We also invite you to prayerfully consider how you share your talents and time at Hosanna. Please prayerfully consider if God is calling or nudging you to serve as a support advocate. We need someone to step up and answer this call to help our, the leadership of our congregation to continue to do God's work in this world. Please consider if God is laying that on your heart. We are worshiping together apart, yet it's important for us all to remember that the ministry of Hosanna continues through your continued sharing, not only of your financial resources, but of your gifts and your time as well. We wanna thank you in advance for your generosity. receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. On this last Sunday after Epiphany, let us offer all our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. Responding to each petition, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for communities of faith around the globe, for our own congregation, for all our pastor, and for all Christians who cannot gather for communal worship. Show us your face in the darkness and speak your word of power to all the faithful. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Son of Righteousness, we pray for our nation's elected leaders, for attorneys and juries, and for all who work for justice in our land. Give to them all integrity and service and courage to choose what is right. We pray for our citizenry, that prejudice cease, that resentment about the election wane, and that violence be averted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Beautiful Savior, we pray for all who suffer from COVID-19, for medical workers, and for all who await the vaccine. We pray for those enduring famine, for those experiencing homelessness, and for all who live in war zones. We pray for all who are ill, for all who receive no medical care, and for those we name here before you. Elna, Carol, Chuck, 
Cindy, Joanne, Becky, Mary Lou, and Dan. Heal them with your loving might. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Love divine, we pray for those especially on this Valentine's Day feel lonely, for those who are abandoned, and for those who must live apart from their dear ones, especially for those mourning the loss of loved ones this year, especially Lonnie Olgen on the death of his uncle, Clint Cooker. Embrace all who are alone with your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Shine, Jesus, shine also on us and receive the petitions of our hearts. O Holy Trinity, light creator, light of light begotten, and light revealer, receive our praise and hear our prayers for the sake of the one who dwells among us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing. May God, the creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the beloved, fill you and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Transfiguration Sunday. We heard the readings of how Jesus' appearance changed to a glowing white. He was transfigured on the mountaintop. Then God the Father said, 
This is my beloved. Listen to him. We rejoice on this special day. And one word we use when we rejoice is the word Alleluia, which is on this beautiful cloth. Alleluia. The Hebrew version is Hallelujah. It's from Hallel, which means praise, and Yah, the name of God. Hallelujah, praise the name of God. The Greek translation is Alleluia. This means God be praised. So now, join with me from home as we say it three times together. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. This is also the last Sunday in the time after Epiphany. So we're going to put away this exuberant word of Alleluia. We're going to put it away during the entire season of Lent, which begins on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. We're still going to praise God, pray, sing hymns, and worship, but the mood will change from the joyful exuberance of Alleluia to more quiet expressions of words like, have mercy on us, I'm sorry, forgive us. We will hear the stories of Jesus' wonderful love for us and for the world. We'll also focus on thinking about how he was willing to suffer and die for us. So I'm now going to put Alleluia carefully and securely away in this treasure chest. And it will stay there, and we won't use it until we come to Easter. And then we will bring it out and have that joyful exuberance and sing and pray and praise to the rooftops. Alleluia. Go in peace, be a light of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>